something special for you today. Woo! I have news. News Mom Shower is from Weird Kids, and they've been around for quite a while. Um, how do you do that? That is a very good question. I want to say to myself, because if you want to stay indie and alive, that takes a lot of effort and compromises. Uh, Weird Beard is known for 99 bricks that got the entire Dutch game industry hooked to this iPhone and mobile game in which they're actually currently converting to something even weirder and more interesting. That's uh, playable on consoles outside here. And uh, let's hear how we can survive in this harsh industry. Okay, thank you. Well, hello everybody. So I'm Niels, I'm one of the co-founders of, uh, of Weird Beard Games, and um, yeah, I have a bit of a weird title, and I'm going to explain why business is not about money. Um, and so how you should value your, your game developers. Yeah. So first something about me, so you know a bit more about my background. Um, so, well, that's me, uh, I'm Niels. Um, uh, yeah, so what time is it? This is our game, Nine and Bricks, which we released last year, sort of a mixture between Tetris and Jenga. Uh, and we, we won a Dutch game award with that, so we were very happy about that last year. And uh, we're actually now working on a, a multiplayer version for PlayStation 4, which you can uh, give a try on, on the alpha build, which is at booth 29 at the end. So if you want to see what it is, uh, come join us. Um, I studied artificial intelligence at the University of Amsterdam, so I'm a programmer, you could say, from uh, origin. Then I worked at ING Bank for 10 weeks. Um, <laughs> then, then I got the hell out of there because it, I hated it. Uh, but I do know something about money, so it, it's not. Uh, I know what I'm talking about. Uh, so I, at the same time, I, I, I founded uh, Weird Beard Games together with uh, two, two other guys. And uh, currently, I'm also teaching at uh, uh, School of Arts in Utrecht, uh, Management and Entrepreneurship. Um, so that's uh, that's me. Uh, that's also me. So um, I'm. So what do I do? Well, I'm, I'm a bit, the, the business guy. I do everything that is not development at Weird Beard. So I don't do coding or art or audio or, or whatever. I do management, uh, PR, HR. Uh, I'm I do Twitter stuff, um, I, I water plants, um, and I do business development. So uh, everything that's not development, that's, that's basically not saying it's other people are not doing it's other stuff, but this is what I do. Um, so why am I giving this talk? Well, I've been doing this for, for seven and a half years now, and um, at Weirbird we were in the beginning, as a starting studio, we were very focused actually on money, not like we wanted to be rich or anything, but just we wanted to keep it float. Uh, and that's something I think a lot of starting CBS struggle with. And we were actually so focused on being a stable and solid, uh, having a stable and solid foundation, that we forgot, forgot about the games uh, at some point, which is, which is not good. And so we, we started thinking about money and um, why, why it's important. And I came to this conclusion actually, as a game your studio, it's not about money, it's about creating value in your company. Um, and you want to do that so you can keep making great games, that's, that's your goal. But what is value? Well, when you know what value is, let me start with that, you know if you're doing stuff right in your studio, and you know you have a valuable studio or not, and then you also know how you can improve your studio. You can compare yourself to others, you can learn and, and try to, to create new value. Basically that's business development. Business development is making your studio more valuable. So why is it not about money? And when it is not about money, then why is everybody talking about money all the time? Well, that's very simple actually. It's easy. It's easy to compare yourself to someone else. When you say, okay, I made a million, and then you say, yeah, I made two million, then you are better than me. Well, that's not true. I'll come back to that later. Some people say you can help to steer your process, to steer your business. That actually is also 
not true. And money is nuts. So, <laughs> money is a comparison. Uh, you, you, well, when you go on the internet and you, you Google, like, give me the top 10 most successful game companies or whatever, you will get graphs like this, list with, okay, they made so many millions and this and this. But it's actually very hard to find trustworthy data uh, because you only see the success stories uh, and people only um, tell you, for instance, they give you your, their sales numbers and they said, oh, we, we, we sold a million copies. And you look it up and you go to Steam and you see, oh, it's ten, ten dollars a piece, so that's ten million dollars. What they don't tell you is that they made 90% of their sales in a Steam sale and that they gave 10% away as a sort of promotion. So basically they made like a tenth of what you would think they, they did. So it's very hard to find trust, trustworthy data. It's also a very complex way, uh, actually. I mean, it looks simple, like, okay, I made two million, you made one million. But um, what about the cost in my studio and your studio? What about the risk I took? I mean, maybe um, I took a lot of risk. You hear a lot of these indie stories and studios, and then we almost went, went bankrupt, and then we just made it. When you go to GDC, like 90% of the talk is like that. Uh, so we, we always went bankrupt, and we, we, we were crying, blah, 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 and then we got saved by Nintendo. That's, that's always what happens. Um, that's not how I want to do my business, but it's also maybe not how you want to do it, and you don't hear the stories of the studios who do go bankrupt just before that. Um, it's also a snapshot, often it's, it's the, the numbers you see are taken just after the release of the game. What if that's their only game that was ever successful, you don't know how successful the studio really is. And finally, that's actually the most important reason, knowing your place doesn't help you improve. I mean, when I'm at the ranks number 100,000, well, then I know that's my place, and that's all I know. So the other one was money to steer. Um, when you would have a store, like, like let's say you're working at Albert Heijn, then actually you can use money and income to steer your company, because you can see, okay, in January we made so many sales, in February we made so many sales, in March we made so many sales, well, that's all great. And then you can see, okay, we're not doing so well, we have to change something. That's fine. But game development game <coughs> takes a lot of time. So something maybe you were working on a game for many, many years, and then at the end, when you're done, then you can start selling it. And then you know how much money you made. So during the process of development, the money doesn't tell you anything. So money is nice. Well, that's true. Um, and there are people who have money and there are people who don't have money. Um, but having money is not the goal of your game development studio. The goal is making games. And the games industry is a very competitive business in a, in, a, in a way. And you will never know for sure if you'll make it or not. But at least you're doing something which is fun to do. And if you really are in it for the money, go work at a bank because they use money to make money. So it's a different industry. Um, so then now, that's the reason why you shouldn't use money to value your studio. So how do you have to value your studio? Who here knows Maslow? Okay, good. Maslow, he made a pyramid. Not this pyramid. Um, he made a, a pyramid which tells you about the value of life, about happiness in a way. And I'm first going to explain this a bit, very short to you, and then I will switch to, to games again. So, at the bottom of the pyramid of, of happiness is the physiological part. And that's, um, to be at least a bit happy, you have to be able to breathe, you have to eat, you have to drink. Well, he says you also have to be able to have sex, and you have to be able to go to the loo. Um, that's the basic needs uh, of life. Then there's safety. Safety is actually uh, looking ahead and knowing that you will have all these things in a month or a year from now. That's the feeling of, um, well, of security. Then comes love or friendship, family, but the feeling that you belong to a group of, of people so you're not alone. 
And then on top of that comes esteem, which is basically being valued by that group as an important member of it, which makes you feel very important and, and happy. It can also be the self-esteem or, or respect. And at the top of the pyramid is self-actualization. And it's, it's a bit more complex term, it's a bit more vague, but in a way that's um, giving meaning to your life, becoming a better person, uh, being creative, being, being uh, a moral person. So then when you have all these things at the bottom, you can really start improving yourself as a person. Well, for that Maslow, that's about people. So now, a pyramid for companies. So I basically made sort of the same pyramid and I will go through this uh, layer by layer. And this basically will represent the value of your company. So at the bottom of the pyramid is labor, is hard work. Just like um, when we're uh, talking about people, uh, it's about the basic needs in, in a way. And the basic needs in a, uh, a company are production, are coding, art, audio, game design. And the questions you will have to ask yourself uh, in this layer of your company is, um, are my costs low enough for the money I have? Because this is not a, a layer where you can find more work or do other stuff. And can I eat? Um, if you can't, you will have to find ways to cut costs, cut features, uh, work harder, code better, draw faster, whatever to make this work. This part is hard. This is where a starting company is. Um, if you survive this layer, that is what sets you apart from being a hobbyist. If you don't survive this layer, basically you're not a company, you're somebody who has, has a hobby making games, sorry. Um, if that's you and you want to stay there, that's fine, but the rest of the talk is not for you. So what is business development about? Business development is basically about everything on top of this layer. It's building your business. And actually the hard part comes after this layer, because in this layer you're actually very focused on money, because you are always thinking, like, do we have not enough money to eat, and will we make it this month? And um, you will have to learn to let go of that, that feeling. And that's scary, because actually uh, it's, it's a bit counterintuitive. Um, so the next layer is stability. The same as in Maslow, it is looking ahead. It is, will I be able to uh, survive in a year? And it does not have to do so much with money as it has more to do with management. Um, because do we get stuff done on time? When, and that's something you will have to learn. Um, you will have to learn how long does it take me to build this feature? How long does it take me to make this fun? Because in the beginning, it's easy when you, uh, when you didn't make it to the deadline, you go in crunch for two weeks and the game is done. But the bigger the project becomes, the longer the crunch will become. So when you want to grow as a company, you will be, have to be able to really get things and stuff done on time. And it can be by improving your, your process, but it can also be by cutting features or, or whatever. It's for you to find out how you want to do that. But don't let it always be in crunch time. Um, and the other important question is, do we have work to do after this project or after this month? Because there's nothing more expensive basically than people doing nothing. Um, so that is where you have to focus your, your acquisition and your, your sales a bit. So uh, make sure you have another project. Um, a lot of starting studios who are working on their first game, they at some point have their first game sort of finished, and then there's the time that it is uh, released and then they're all working on promoting this game but actually before this release you should have already started on your the next game and start working on, on that one as well so try to get that overlap in there. Do you have a heuristic for that? No I think it's I mean what's um, important is that everybody still has to be able to do this work and within a company especially when you grow um, you will see that you will have programmers who are still fixing bugs at the 
the end of the cycle, so you won't have them um, working uh, on your new project, but your game designers or uh, your, your concept artists or whatever, they shouldn't be working on your, your uh, other game anymore. Yeah. They should be working on the next project. Even though you're like, I'm not sure if I will ever be able to make this project if it was enough money to make this project. You will have to because otherwise you're wasting time after release of your current project. Mm -hmm. So then comes the next layer, and that is that is that's people. Um, and I think for us, we 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 were a bit between the stability layer and the people layer for, for quite a long time, um, because we were focusing on getting a, a stable uh, studio for a very long time. And the danger, we, the trap we fell into is that we started to do a lot of work for higher projects which were also non-game related. So we forgot about uh, making games in a way. So we were so focused on getting a stable and, and very well uh, oiled machine that we forgot on the layers on top. Um, so people. and. That is uh, about your co-workers or your staff, uh, your HR department, whatever, but also it's about your peers, so other uh, game developers in the industry who are not working on your project in a way. And the most important thing there is, do I trust these people? And, um, well, it's very easy for, you, for yourself to, to check if you trust people. If you're micromanaging, if you're checking every feature, um, if you talk about your subordinates instead of more your colleagues, then you're not trusting those people. And you'll have to, because uh, the bigger the games become and the more games you make, the less time you have to focus on small stuff. So you will have to let go of the small stuff. Otherwise, you will have to hire someone else to do the big stuff um, and, and, and you stay an employee yourself. But you will have to still trust others to do their job properly. And the other way around, well, can people trust me? If I say I'm going to do something, will I do it? And what, what can help you to, to create a trust is, is really making stuff very clear, uh, making very clear appointments, uh, making clear contracts, uh, having a clear vision on your product. So, um, then also to measure your your peers, it's just very simple. How many people do you know? And how well do you know them? And try to put a number on that. And do I help others and do they help me? Because when you build up that network, when maybe at some point you uh, need an audio specialist, you already know one. You don't have to start looking for them. So really, um, always be working on your, on your network. Then we go to the next layer. And that's about reputation. So in the, in the muscle one, that was the esteem one. And um, that's both about your products and about your studio. So uh, in the company, you would say that's your PR marketing division uh, and also your networking skills. Um, and questions you would have to ask, how is my product reviewed? Is it reviewed often enough? Um, and can I start bringing that? And then the most simple question is, am I famous? And you can actually measure if you're famous in a very easy way. Go to a conference. When more people approach you than you approach, you're famous. And actually just the number of people that approach you, that determines how famous you are. Um, so that's, that can, can help. I have 10 minutes. So then the, the top of the layer, and that is the mission. And that's actually one of the, the hardest ones. That is giving meaning um, to, to your company in a way. So why are we here? Why are we doing this? And a mission statement basically describes the reason of the existence for your company. And that might sound, sound very simple, but it's not very easy. Like, we want to make great games is not a good mission statement. Because it doesn't help you make decisions on what you will do and will not do. Um, for instance, when you say, I want to make games that make people cry, 
then you already know much better which games you will make and will not make. Another example, we all know what a Nintendo game is. Nobody has to explain what a Nintendo game is, because Nintendo, they have a very clear, uh, clear mission statement. So everybody in the company and everybody outside the company already knows what a Nintendo game is. And that helps you not to micromanage, it helps, it helps you also make decisions. Okay, I have this great game idea and I have this great game idea. Which one am I going to choose? So important questions here are, do, well, there's actually only three questions, so it's very simple. Do I have a mission? Did I achieve that mission, and am I on that mission? Yes. What is your mission? Mm. Yeah, we were still working on that one. Uh, <laughs> all right, fair enough. Um, I will come back to that at, at the end, if time quiz. I, I really want to finish my story, but if I have time, I will, I will answer that. So, that's your, your mission statement, and that should help everybody within, their, in, within your company to understand what your company is about, and uh, to... Um, well, to make the products you want them to make. So this is the entire uh, pyramid again. So labor, stability, people, reputation, and mission. So now it's the question, of course, how are you going to use this as a tool in your company? Well, create your own company pyramid. Um, for each layer, you can create performance indicators. So, for instance, uh, at the um, stability layer, you could say, well, we, we want to be able to manage time. Uh, how many times am I going over time? Not on a project scale, but okay, I say this feature is going to take eight hours. How much time is it going to really, it really take? And just measure it. And when you're doing well, you don't have to change anything. If you're not doing well, you have to change it or something. And, there's uh, a lot of, of, of tools uh, for that. I mean, uh, for every layer that's different, you can use uh, for uh, management. You can say, okay, we're going to use an agile approach, or we're going to, or we're going to learn to cut uh, features more easily. I mean, we're to attach the features or something. Um, when you say on the reputation scale, I want to have uh, 5,000 Twitter followers, that's fine. When you didn't make it, why didn't did you? Did you not put in enough time or effort, or maybe you will have to find someone else to do it if you're not good at it. So start measuring all these things. Discuss everything per layer. Never discuss all the layers at the same time because it will drive you crazy. But make sure that the layers connect. If you say, I want to be crazy famous, I want everybody in the world to know me, that's great. Um, but it has to be realistic as well. I mean, if you want to achieve something like that, then uh, also your production capability should be huge if your ambition is that big. So make sure you're still working with a pyramid. Um, so when you have those KPIs, check them regularly and use tools for other people to, to reach those. So to wrap up and to, to give you a bit of an idea of how it looks for, for weird beard, this was weird period in 2008. <laughs> um, this is, so this is a year after we started, basically. Um, we were talking a lot about our mission, what we wanted to do. We wanted to make console titles with AI, and we had great visions about that. But uh, and we spent a lot of time on that. But actually, we didn't work that much. Uh, we were very uncertain what we would do in two months from, from any given day. Um, actually, I was very happy about myself and my two colleagues, so people were great. Um, and nobody had ever heard of this. So, um, as you can see, when you make this, you're, you're like, well, this is not a stable or valuable company. This is, this is all wrong. So then we started, actually, we started working on that. And this is 2011, what I said. We started focusing very much on the process and on the labor, and we were doing a lot of development work, which was uh, non-gaming related. And um, we were actually pretty good at it. We, we made money, and, and we knew what we would do, we'd be doing in six months from now. <coughs> and actually, people were also very nice and intelligent, and, and everybody was happy. But we had no clue why we were doing this what we were doing, and actually that's also why nobody had ever heard of us. 
and we were around for quite some years already at the time. So we had to change again. We kicked out all the non-game development work, and then 2014 happened. And actually, so that's the year we released, released Nine Man Bricks, and we, our reputation was, was pretty good at that time. A lot of people uh, knew about us, but, uh, and, and people thought we were making millions with the game. That was not true, actually. Uh, uh, the people was, I was also very happy with people, but we were so focused on bringing out that game that we, had, we were not able to do enough actual physical labor. And so halfway through the year, it was not that good of a situation for Great Beard. Um, so now we're focusing on getting the, the pyramid right again. And I hope in 2015 <laughs> it will look exactly like this. Um, so that was my talk. I hope you, you can uh, well use it for yourself to, to evaluate your business in with different uh, measurements than money because it's really not uh, it won't help you steer or achieve anything. Um, time for questions. There already was one question. Uh, what is your mission? Um, well, we're, we're thinking about that a lot, and um, at the moment we, we see games as a great medium, which is still very young in a way, but can help people have like uh, meaningful and, and life-changing experiences in a way. Um, we're not making games right now which are doing something like that. <laughs> um, but um, it is something we want to work towards in, in, in a way. We, we want to give you a, a, a new experience which makes you think. I think one of the most important things in the world actually is to give people an insight in how another person feels uh, or what another person um, is, is thinking. And making, if I can make one of my players think about another person, what that person is thinking, it would be great. But it's very ambitious. So I'm not sure if that's our message statement yet. <coughs> other questions? Yes? Have you tried to compare yourself to other companies by trying to make a pyramid of that company comparing it with your own? Um, I've never made an entire uh, pyramid for another company. I have been working on layers specifically. <coughs> Uh, looking at other companies, and I think that's also, um, you go a bit crazy when you look uh, at the entire pyramid all the, all the time and for, to another company as well. But you can like uh, feel, okay, we're doing very well on the reputation, but we're not doing well on people. So then you start looking at companies where you think that, okay, people are very happy there, they, they love working there. What are they doing better than what I'm doing? And then, okay. I want to do that as well, and then you have to see that how it fits the rest of your pyramid. So, what actually happens when you cut your pyramid right? Are you happy to develop? Then you're you're very happy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's I mean um, that's that's what you want, and you can well then you can do a lot of things. I mean you can keep just going like that. I mean that always have to be more and more and more. We we, we live in a capitalistic environment and world, but you don't have to be a capitalist. Um, you could just keep on going as you're going. You could say, okay, stop doing this because this is fun. I start a new company. Uh, you can also make it grow. You say, okay, we're now doing this with 10 people and we're making one game a year. Let's try to make it twice as big. If that's what you want. I mean, it depends on what you want. Um, I think you need a lifetime to achieve a perfect period. <laughs> or actually, when you look at the Egyptians, you Many, many <laughs> or slaves. Yeah, or slaves, a lot of slaves. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think that was that was it. Thank you, Nils.